The following program is brought to you by Caltech. And uh, next we will have Paul Goldsmith, who is the chief technologist uh, for uh, astronomy and physics at JPL. And uh, uh, Paul's uh, research inter interests are in molecular clouds and uh, long wavelength astronomy, uh, far infrared, uh, some millimeter all the way up to centimeter uh, wave instrumentation. And uh, he's going to continue the discussion, I guess, at longer wavelengths in astrophysics applications of airships. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for the chance to talk a little bit about a personal view of how airships um, fit into uh, all the different um, platforms that we conceivably have uh, to do astronomy with. Uh, it's from the point of view of long wavelengths, uh, astrophysics, by that I mean, uh, let's say, long word of 100 microns, uh, these, I think, are the critical advantages, the most important being the atmosphere. As you've heard, a very thorough introduction by Steve Lord. Uh, there's uh, there, the, the increase in altitude makes a substantial improvement in general over that from an airplane. Uh, sometimes it's a, a going from OK, as uh, Jens said, to very good. There also are uh, some, uh, as we'll see, some frequencies at which the aircraft altitude is still pretty much opaque and a significant reduction in, in uh, atmospheric noise, which, uh, given the state of the art in heterodyne receivers, does mean that the overall sensitivity is improved not only because of the transmission being greater, but also the system noise temperature is reduced. To me, uh, based on my experience, one of the big potential advantages is the increased observing time. Uh, the uh, numbers that have been prevent, presented for uh, SOFIA are, are the uh, eventual goals, and we hope they'll reach them. But up till now, at least, the amount of observing time that's actually been available is very small. Uh, another issue is, a, is, of course, an airship does, in principle, give you access to the whole galactic plane and the whole sky. That's certainly an advantage relative to the currently available Antarctic balloon sites. And the further is this one about the communications. Having been involved in some balloon work from the Antarctic, once you are uh, more than a few hours into your flight, you have to send your data back via the TDRS satellite, which for which you're charged a lot of money, and you can only get a very modest bandwidth. So in fact, uh, if you could have direct uh, line of sight communications, you could, of course, do much better than the 60 kilobits per second via TDRS and uh, um, essentially have mu be much closer contact with your uh, data. Uh, I'm going to uh, also... Uh, just diver, um, digress a little bit to point out that this issue of the time availability is really important. Uh, I was involved in a recent proposal for an ultra-long duration balloon mission called Gusto that was going to survey these three fine structure lines that Steve told you about uh, with a modest size focal plane array each, that is 16 pixels of each of these. And even so, we were proposing to do things like survey the central region of our galaxy, but that was going to get the required two million spectra in the, covering this region. This was with a one meter telescope, by the way. It was going to require 40 days, essentially, full time uh, to do uh, uh, the uh, survey of the large Magellanic Cloud, which is a fantastic, important astronomical object because it's a nearby galaxy with much lower metallicity than the Milky Way and thus gives you an idea what star formation and whatnot would be like much earlier in the universe to do this sort of 50-ish square degree region of the Magellanic Clouds would take another uh, month or so and then to look at sort of deeper, uh, deep, more, look more deeply at selected regions around in the Milky Way and Magellanic Clouds and really dig into that O1 line, which is somewhat 
more limited in its extent, would take another 20 days. So right there, and this was not doing the whole thing by any means. We're talking about many months of observing. So I think that's one of the key uh, key things that we want to think about. In other words, a, a few-day duration airship flight is not, I think, offer significant advantages compared to a balloon. And the balloon program exists. You can actually apply to it every year. And so we're talking about having to convince NASA to invest in a whole new uh, platform, I think you have to show that you can do things that you simply would, would have a very hard time to do from a balloon. Now, this was, of course, a balloon program. It was not, unfortunately, selected. But uh, it, so you even have to say that you want to do something better than that. Well, I think in a long wavelengths, I do think the fine structure lines and, uh, are, are critically important. Uh, the ones that Steve mentioned here, I've also added the neutral carbon line, which is doable rather painfully from high mountaintop sites, but not much has been done with it. So uh, I think one thing to keep in mind for the airships and this galactic and nearby galaxy spectroscopy is you have to look carefully at each individual line. And you heard about, the, uh, about this because, in fact, when you look at those big figures of the transmission uh, you really have no idea whether how much it's going to impede your particular observation. So if you look at, the, uh, at this O1 line at uh, 145 microns, it turns out that it's sitting right on top of an ozone line. Uh, and so you can't do very good galactic work at all. And going to an airship is not going to make much improvement. Uh, because the scale height of ozone is too large. On the other hand, if you looked at these other redshifts, uh, for look here at, at uh, some uh, here and here, those do improve significantly if you go up to 60,000 feet. So you do get, uh, you get some help, but it's not going to be dramatic. Uh, Steve actually already showed this image, which is, of course, done with his program, ATRAN. And I think my request to Steve would be that he enable ATRAN to go to higher altitudes than 60,000 feet uh, routinely, uh, which is its current, uh, well, the public upper limit. But even going there, you do see this huge advantage. For gal this is at zenith for O1. From Sophia altitude, you would typically get 70% uh, transmission. But you can't look at zenith with Sophia. That, you remember, the, the, they had to limit the size of the hole in the airplane. And so you're always looking at roughly two air masses or more. So you have, instead, you're down at about 50% transmission. Well, typically, if you're looking, uh, you, you'll try to do a little better, but OK. Um, the, uh, actual uh, situation, of course, gets immediately much worse once you try to look out into the slightly redshifted universe. And uh, that's where you do see a huge improvement uh, when you go up to airship altitude. Of course, a balloon is even better. But I think you have to, therefore, construct the science case uh, fairly carefully. Now, um, Naturally, the C1 line is, I think, of great interest. The C1 line is the most luminous far infrared line from uh, external galaxies and, and from the Milky Way. That's par in part because it comes from almost every phase of the interstellar medium. It's so easy to ionize carbon that you see ionized carbon from the diffuse interstellar medium, from PDRs, and even from H2 regions. Those all contribute. The only way you're going to disentangle that is to have high-resolution spectroscopy. And these are some examples of Herschel uh, Gotzi plus uh, uh, spectra, uh, just showing that, indeed, you can distinguish uh, looking between, through these different regions from the line widths and velocities. So that's the kind of system you want, I think. Uh, the C plus line also has the important advantage that if you get very good signal to noise, you, be, you can detect the 13 uh, uh, C plus line, which has three hyperfine components. That's been done from the uh, Sophia uh, by the great uh, instrument. And uh, in fact, you can use this to, co to confirm the optical depth of the, uh, of the uh, main line. Uh, 
Herschel was not designed to be uh, uh, the hi-fi instrument on the Herschel, at least to be a great mapping instrument because it only had a single pixel. But this is a map of the uh, C2 emission from Orion, uh, and you see a lot of structure uh, uh, in that. You also, since you have velocity resolved spectra, you, you do also, you can see large velocity shifts. This data has not really been uh, analyzed fully yet, but of course here are the, tr the bar and the trapezium and the uh, center of the molecular emission uh, all there. I think this is the kind of thing that will be required to develop a template for how C plus emission is produced. Now, I'm going to propose in a moment a fairly aggressive uh, concept for an airship instrument, which would be to have a 10-meter submillimeter telescope on board. Uh, that gives you the ability, for example, to have a few arc second beam at C+, and you could then make maps of nearby galaxies. Uh, this is M51 with beautiful work done by Jin Koda, Nick Scoville, and others, where you see, of course, the spiral structure. And one of the things here is you see all these molecular clouds or molecular associations between the spiral arm. They're not supposed to exist, according to many models. But then, for, for better or worse, there they are. And the question is, if you could do the same thing in C+, you could ask, well, how much of the carbon in these interarm regions is still carbon monoxide and how much has been converted uh, to C+. And you need, though, good angular resolution to do this in, even in M51, a rather nearby neighbor, and especially in somewhat more distant galaxies. Uh, okay, so here's the transmission. Well, that does, uh, here's the Milky Way. We're, we're pretty lucky, right? Because uh, if, uh, if, on the other hand, you're not going to do M31, or uh, very well, or M3083, but there are ranges of velocities where you can work uh, reasonably effectively from, the, from an aircraft. Things get noticeably better. You notice for the Milky Way is almost perfect, and you're at least not too badly here for some nearby galaxies. But as Steve indicated, you and I will repeat, you have to look very carefully to make sure your object of interest is not in a disastrous hole. Another interesting uh, molecule is uh, HEH+. This is just the kind of thing that hasn't been given a lot of attention yet. Um, this is uh, uh, probably one of the first molecules that appeared in the universe, since you can make it before you have any he heavy elements at all. Uh, it also may be detectable in today in H2 regions in our galaxies. It's at a uh, difficult frequency However, this was above the Herschel hi-fi range, and it does seem to lie alarmingly close to uh, an ozone line here, uh, but uh, we'd have to look uh, more carefully. If you go to the airship, you may be able to do it there, but uh, you'd have to look carefully exactly at your source velocity. So I think that um, if you want to do something that you cannot do, from an ultra-long duration balloon, or from SOFIA, uh, you have, to, I think the obvious thing is to try to conceive of whether you can have a, a much larger antenna. That's not only good for angular resolution for molecular clouds, but also things like those protostellar disks that Jeff was talking about. A 10-meter telescope, in comparison to Herschel, would have an order of magnitude more collecting area the fact that it was not at 80 Kelvin would not have any significance on effect on the uh, heterodyne sensitivity. And you'd be going down to about the one arc second uh, beam size, which is good, but it's bad, right? Because now you're talking about a serious pointing issue or challenge. Uh, I think the technology to uh, equip this with large large, well, by far infrared standards, some tens of elements of focal plane arrays is possible. You could do continuum work with such a telescope, but I am less convinced that it's a winning proposition because, A, this is not big enough to get away from the confusion of the extragalactic background, if that's what you're interested in, and it's not cold enough to be super sensitive. So you're, it's kind of not... I think, a very sweet spot for continuum work. So I think spectroscopy is the winner. 
polarimetry is kind of interesting. There is, of course, the ability to study magnetic fields um, via the continuum uh, absorption or emission from dust. Uh, Sophia is going to have a rather nice continuum polarimeter in a couple of years, the Hawk Plus uh, instrument uh, being developed at uh, JPL and Goddard, uh, led by Darren Dowell. Uh, you would have some interesting work to do at longer wavelengths for looking at cooler molecular clouds, which are basically too cold to emit at the 100 micron range of uh, Hawk Plus. But um, that's a, uh, that, that needs for, it's the kind of thing that needs further study. 10 meters is, to say the least, an arbitrary uh, choice. You could scale this down. Uh, as I mentioned, a one meter telescope is entirely doable from an ultra long duration balloon for large scale surveys. SOFIA is equipped with a rather nice uh, 2.4 meter telescope. Uh, but gives you limited observing time. I think that the uh, that you need to uh, though look more uh, aggressively uh, in, into larger things. I'll just point out this just because I had this nice picture. This was the design of a one meter offset uh, CFRP uh, telescope for Gusto. So it's like a the telescope used on WMAP or Planck or any CMB experiment com- with no blockage high efficiency, and of course it had uh, star trackers and all of that stuff is doable with a balloon. So whether or not anyone has the uh, nerve or foolishness to propose to extend this to a much bigger thing for an airship is one of the things that I hope uh, will come out of this workshop. But I think if you could, you would have the possibility at least of creating a very exciting scientific program that would include everything from Form, formation and life cycle of molecular clouds in gal- nearby galaxies to the details of star formation in the Milky Way and even the formation of protostellar disks, not to mention comets and everything else. When you have that, this class of telescope, 10 meter size, the sensitivity gain over anything else for water line, uh, for the HDO and other things is really substantial and I think it could be exciting. So thank you very much.